In order to address sacred music, we first have to speak about music. Most of the mistakes people make when it comes to music for liturgy stem from their lack of understanding of the art of music itself and why it's important to exercise discernment in its regard. The first part of my talk will therefore be about good music versus bad music, or we could say more modestly, better versus worse music. The second part will then turn to the kinds of music suitable and unsuitable for Holy Mass. What is the one thing, and perhaps the only thing, that Plato, Aristotle, Boethius, Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, St. Thomas Aquinas, Friedrich Nietzsche, Wagner, Schopenhauer, Joseph Pieper, and Joseph Ratzinger all agree on 100%. They agree that music penetrates into the soul of man, stirring and shaping his inner life, and thereby affecting his perception of and engagement with reality as a whole. Music works from within, pulling one's character to itself and shaping the soul until one feels pleasure only in its embrace and sharp pain in being severed from it. A friend of the great cellist Jacqueline Dupre once said, music never lies. How true this is. People can lie, the lyrics of songs can lie, but the music itself can never lie. In a mysterious way that baffles analysis, music contains and conveys a certain spirit embodied in its rhythms, melodies, and harmonies. We cannot translate this spirit into a sequence of descriptive words. Could we do so, music would cease to be music, it would just be a vaguer form of poetry. Every piece of music has a message that it makes present, transmits to the listener, plants within him. Music does not speak of things, but tells of weal and woe. Those are the words of Joseph Pieper. Music does not speak of things, but tells of weal and woe. It is capable of communicating the giving and receiving of love, trials and pains, intimacy and majesty, nostalgia for what has been, hope against hope for what might still be. In its highest forms, music can point to a grandeur not of this world, more real than this world, glimpsed like a sliver of sun through the clouds, drawing us on and dispelling our despair. It is also possible for music to evoke rage, anxiety, lasciviousness, despair. Is it not something of a miracle that music, even without words, can speak of all this? The philosopher Roger Scruton observes, Nobody who understands the experiences of melody, harmony, and rhythm will doubt their value. Not only are they, in their traditional forms, the distillation of centuries of social life, they are also forms of knowledge, providing the competence to reach out of ourselves through music. Through melody, harmony, and rhythm, we enter a world where others exist besides the self, a world that is full of feeling, but also ordered, disciplined, but free. That is why music is a character-forming force, and the decline of musical taste, a decline in morals. That's scrutiny. The inescapable reality is that we internalize the music we listen to, or sing, or play. It becomes a part of us. It shapes us in its image. Sometimes people hastily dismiss the idea that the music they listen to forms their moral character, that is, how they perceive what is good for themselves and how they should live. But this is impossible for any observant party or person to deny. A friend of mine explains it this way. Extremes in music create recognizable populations. Heavy metal fans dress and walk alike and are often pale and thin. Huge belt buckles and hats pick out the serious country music buffs. Rap consumers fit a stereotype, and on it goes. Along with the visible similarities go internal resemblances. Heavy metal folks are brooding and angry. Rap people are bouncy but irascible. Country, people, country music people are cheerful and loyal, and so on. Few things in life create visible populations the way music does. Drugs do, 
Jobs can. Religious vocations certainly do. Sports don't. Foods don't. You can't necessarily pick out baseball fans from hockey fans in a random crowd of people, or lovers of Italian cuisine as opposed to French cuisine. Living in a certain region can produce a certain look, but the effects of music will override regional differences. The fact that extremes in music create visible populations of people who morally resemble one another indicates that less extreme musical forms, for instance, light jazz, pop, classical music, and so on, are also forming populations in less visible ways. After all, if factor X produces an extreme difference when applied heavily, wouldn't factor X produce some difference if applied more lightly? If extreme musical forms like heavy metal produce extreme visible and moral differences, then wouldn't jazz or baroque music produce real but less extreme moral differences in men? Certainly, the hypothesis that music is morally indifferent doesn't predict the observed results of the extremes. In fact, the observed facts say that music is a powerful moral force. It is used in ecstatic cults for a reason. Or as Roger Scruton says pithily, to withhold all judgment as though a taste in music were on a par with a taste in ice cream is precisely not to understand the power of music. You are what you listen to and look at more than you are what you eat. What we take in through our senses is the food and drink of our souls. And we will be mentally and spiritually healthy or unhealthy depending on the quality of that food and drink. Your eyes and ears are the mouth of your soul. If our music is that of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, of peace, of beauty, of order, we will be eating and drinking the spirit of truth, the love of the Father and the Son. If our music is that of the world or the prince of this world, we will be eating and drinking the spirit of worldliness. We cannot be too careful about this musical dietary discernment. In the letter of St. James, we read, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James 4.4. St. Paul gives us our resounding marching orders when he declares to the Romans, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's Romans 12, 1-2. Art and ethics are to some extent distinct from each other. A virtuous man will not necessarily produce good art, and a vicious man will not necessarily produce bad art. The former may give us sentimental kitsch, and the latter may give us a masterpiece. However, over time, and in ways both subtle and obvious, moral evils and intellectual evils, I mean vices and errors, will damage or destroy the soundness of the art that emerges from a soul infected by them. So just to give an obvious example, a drunken poet might write good poetry for a while, but if he keeps getting more and more drunk, he's, gonna, he's not gonna be able to write good poetry anymore. So eventually vice and error will catch up with the artist and will corrupt the art. Hence, we should be vigilant, even scrupulous, about the influences we allow into our souls. This has always been true and will always be true. No matter how different modern man may appear to be, he still has a mind to nourish, a heart to shape, and a soul to save. And that soul will be saved through the same virtues, the same harmony of faith and reason, reason and passions, as that of pre-modern man, post-modern man, and any other man there may ever be. As rational animals, and even more, as Christians who worship the crucified and risen Logos, the incarnate Word of God, we ought to nourish our souls to the extent possible on the best of the fine arts, giving less room to what is mediocre or shallow, and none at all to what is base or vulgar. As St. Paul says to the Philippians, 
Brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Philippians 4.8. We are called to pursue excellence in all aspects of life, including our leisure and recreational activities. Those, are not, those don't get a pass as if they're somehow se separated from rational and Christian life. St. Paul writes to St. Titus, the grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men, training us to renounce irreligion and worldly passions and to live sober, upright, and godly lives in this world. Titus 2, 11, 12. Indeed, our rational human nature and the grace of God drive us toward perfection. We ought, therefore, to be concerned about our culture's descent into mediocrity, banality, sensuality, ugliness, and violence. This slide threatens to destroy high culture and authentic folk culture, both of which are beautiful in their own ways. We should not be relativists or subjectivists about artistic truth any more than we are about the objective reality of human nature and the natural law. Anyone who is consistent will see that the beautiful, like its companions, the good and the true, is not reducible to subjective whim, but is based on objective criteria that already point towards the divine. That was not a plant, by the way. I was just sort of like, you know, to illustrate my point here. <clears throat> Palestrina and Bach are great, not because they just happened to cough up inspired music as if by an irrational spasm, but because their minds and hearts were beautifully attuned to the microcosmic and macrocosmic principles of harmony and rhythm. A lot of different styles of beautiful music can emerge from these principles, but the principles themselves are real and not created by man. They are discovered, internalized, and brought to fruition in works of art. But so far, I am painting with a broad brush. Can we be more specific about what's problematic with certain kinds of music and what's good about more artistically refined music? Well, I'm going to try. Rhythm is the most basic element of music, the most primitive. This is why. <laughs> I wonder if this is going to keep going on. It's like a, a sort of a comedy routine here. Maybe. <laughs> so. so rhythm is the most primitive element of music. This is why the music of some primitive cultures consists mostly of drumming. More advanced cultures, presupposing the framework of rhythm, develop beautiful melodies above it. The most advanced cultures, presupposing both rhythm and melody, develop a system of harmony. When you listen to a piece by, for example, William Byrd, Antonio Vivaldi, Mozart, or Tchaikovsky, the rhythm, although discernible, is subordinated to the melody and harmony which takes center stage. Rock, rap, metal, pop, and other such popular, quote-unquote, popular styles invert this rational hierarchy of rhythm, melody, and harmony. Such styles accentuate the beat, strip the harmonic framework to a bare minimum, and employ repetitious, unlyrical melodies, if they can even be called that, in order to stimulate the concupiscible and irascible sense appetites in a disordered manner. In everyday language, that means the music is designed to overstimulate passions like desire and anger. We are dealing here with music that is deliberately primitive, passionate, and sensual. It is one thing for such music to proceed from barely literate savages who don't know any better, but it is quite another for it to proceed from the descendants of a rich folk culture and a resplendent high culture. In this case, the case of the West, the Western civilization, it amounts to a rejection of one's own providential inheritance. We are the beneficiaries of over a thousand years of glorious Western music, a heritage that has no parallel in any other civilization. Each one of us, as a rational animal, as a citizen of the West, and as a Christian, should take hold of it and take advantage of it. As I said before, we should be striving for excellence, not only spiritual and moral, 
but also intellectual and arti artistic. A steady diet of rock, heavy metal, rap, or pop carries with it the serious risk of stunting or warping one's moral growth, narrowing one's intellectual horizons, and impeding or clouding one's spiritual life. In a world of commercialized propaganda in favor of hedonism, materialism, and relativism, we need to be very careful about the message we are taking in. Am I saying that popular music always has to be bad? That the only good music there is is that of a cultural elite? Are all of us supposed to become snobs? No, not at all. I mean, it wouldn't hurt to develop some cultural sophistication. After all, it's a perfection of our rational nature as made in the image and likeness of God. Yet, the point is not sophistication for its own sake, so that you can drop the names of composers at a cocktail party. The point is to develop an ear for what is beautiful and fitting for every occasion, with all the diversity that occasions call for. When sitting around a campfire, one should sing folk songs. At a square dance, one should have good old-fashioned square dance music. At a wedding reception, one might showcase waltzes, swings, and country dances. This may sound crazy to people living in the modern mainstream, but I've been to many weddings where the selection of music at the reception is tasteful, and where real dances are done by adventurous young people. I mean, like, real, real dances, you know? <laughs> dances you can name. I suspect it is somewhat like the traditional Latin mass. The young take to it readily, while some folks from the boomer generation frown at this strange departure from the Woodstock paradigm. Allow me to digress for a moment about dancing. The rarity of the use of triple time, 3-4 signature, in pop music bespeaks a loss of the art of dance. Dances in triple time, the waltz being the most famous, but there are many others too, such as the Lendler that was made famous in a kind of Hollywood version in The Sound of Music, right? These, these dances in triple time are notable for their lilting, gentle, noble, or debonair attitude. If ever there was a manifest sign of cultural degeneration, it would have to be the descent from minuet to waltz to swing to disco, to deafening nightclub mixes of throbbing monotony, where people dance by pulsating and gyrating in an aerobic-type exercise of random individuals. With each step in the descent, we see a lessening of the social and communal dimension of dance, which is supposed to be an imitation of the orderly cosmos and of the complementary relationship of the sexes within it. With each step, we see a decrease of formal beauty, a lapse of dignity, a loosening of morals, and a growing contempt for order, symmetry, and coordination of partners. And really, what I said there, you, you just have to see real dancing to see how beautiful it actually is, right? And then you look at, let's say, a YouTube video of people in a mosh pit or something, and it's really disturbing, actually. In fact, it's, it's even more disturbing. I used to do this exercise with my students in music class. I would get videos of all different sorts of dances, from the minuet down to mosh pits or something, and I would put the video on, but without the sound. So you could just look at the people, what they're doing with their bodies. Very, very interesting. Try that sometime. Experiment. Every normal human occasion has well-crafted music that suits it. So let me be clear. Popular music does not have to be bad. The popular music of a healthy age, like the Catholic Middle Ages, with its pilgrim songs and troubadour ballads, is beautiful through and through. Music to be good does not have to be boring and straight-laced or super refined and subtle. Medieval music displays immediacy, spontaneity, innocence. Its inventive melodies, harmonic ingenuity, and rhythmic drive are compelling and captivating. Much the same could be said about any kind of genuine folk music, which happily has experienced a tremendous revival in recent decades. Think bluegrass or Celtic and Scottish music. You may find it surprising that, so far, I have spent relatively little time talking about lyrics. For many conservative critics, the lyrics are the only thing or the main thing they object to. Back in the Reagan era, which seems like it was, you know, eons ago, Al Gore's wife, Tipper Gore, 
led a successful fight to have parental warning labels affixed to record albums that contained sexually explicit lyrics, portrayed excessive violence, or glorified drugs. But if there is anything I want to impress on you today, it would be that we must give full acknowledgement to the greater power exercised by the music itself, right? apart from the words. A so-called Christian heavy metal band would still harm its listeners' souls by the style of the music, even if this band took its lyrics straight from the Bible. That being said, it is no small problem that vast swaths of today's music is plagued with bad lyrics. Sometimes these lyrics are just plain repulsive, vulgar, obscene, violent, satanic, etc. If you don't believe me, look up the words of some of the favorite radio songs online and actually read the words, right? I, I'm amazed at times at how people listen to things and they don't think about the words of what, you know, what's actually, they're so caught up in the spirit of it, they don't even think about what the words are saying. There can never be an excuse for listening to pieces with lyrics of that sort, no matter what the music may be like. However, the deeper issue, I would say, is the death of worthwhile poetry. Music lovers protest bitterly when I attack the lyrics of their favorite singers, but if you just read the words out loud, like a poem, you can hardly keep from crying or laughing at lyrics that rarely rise above pubescent preoccupations conveyed in high school vocabulary that barely rhymes and almost never respects meter. In short, crummy poetry. The sort of poetry that a lot of people write around the age of 13 or 14 and then they, they throw it away at some point, right? Um, they'd be embarrassed to have it discovered. Catholics, above all, should have no difficulty admitting that there are objective standards in the arts that poetry, like any other art, has its rules and ideals, and that we should care enough to seek out good poetry in music, since we will be giving it a permanent place in our souls, right? There have been studies that show that, that you can remember poetry or words that, that are set to music 25 times more easily and, and more quickly than you can remember words just by themselves, right? So whatever words you're listening to with music, you are planting deep in your soul. The difference between rock, pop, or rap lyrics on the one hand, and medieval popular songs or European lyric poetry on the other, is starker than the difference between night and day. In its diction or word choice, use of metaphor, meter, and rhyme, and conceptual content, the poetry set to music by the great composers is on a level as far above that of today's popular music as the heavens above the earth, or the earth above the underworld. When you listen to Victoria setting to music the lamentations of the prophet Jeremiah, Haydn setting the poet Milton, Schubert setting Goethe, or Vaughan Williams setting George Herbert, then you discover what great poetry united to great music sounds like. If all that I've been saying so far is true, even if it's largely true or probably true, it follows that the music and lyrics we use in Catholic liturgy are of the utmost importance in outwardly expressing to one another and inwardly impressing upon ourselves what we are doing, what we think we are doing, and the meaning it has for us. So I'm going to leave behind one controversial subject and delve into another one. That's what I specialize in. Whenever the popes of modern times speak about sacred, that is, liturgical music, I am referring here above all to Pius X, and Pius XII, though Pius XI, John Paul II, and Benedict XVI have made notable contributions as well, the first quality they put forward is holiness or sanctity, which they describe as worthiness of or suitability for the celebration of the sacred mysteries of Christ, as well as a lack of worldliness or even that which is suggestive of the secular domain. The fathers of the Council of Trent frowned upon the use of secular melodies even when transformed into the style of sacred music. And Pius X fought valiantly against the influence of Italian opera. It was not that such music was not good as far as the rules of composition were concerned. It was that the music carried strong associations with celebrating the goods of this present life and not the heavenly goods of the life to come. If the musical style is borrowed from the outside world and brought into the temple, 
It profanes the liturgy and harms the spiritual progress of the faithful. Liturgical music should not only be, but also seem to be exclusively connected with and consecrated to the liturgy of the church. It is not enough for a type of music to have been intended for the sake of performance in a church. It is crucial that it be felt or experienced as associated with divine worship. So here, impressions count. First impressions count a lot. To some extent, this will be a matter of cultural conditioning. Some people will know more about liturgy and its panoply of fine arts than others. But as followers of Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, who extends his real presence throughout space and time, we acknowledge as a principle of faith that there are hallowed traditions of prayer, ceremonial, and music, slowly matured over many centuries, that practically cry out Catholicism, signs that identify us and bind us to each other and to the Lord. Over the course of more than three decades of experience singing in a variety of churches and settings, I've been astonished by the way that Catholics, the way in which Catholics, even relatively unchurched or uncatechized ones, immediately recognize Gregorian chant as distinctively Catholic and more often than not appreciate some presence of it in the liturgy. Even Hollywood movie directors know that much. Whenever they want to evoke a Catholic atmosphere, they make sure there's chant wafting in the background. Perhaps in this case only, our clergy would be right to take their bearings from the secular world's business sense. The reason Gregorian chant is held up as the supreme model of sacred music and the normative music of the Roman Rite is not far to seek. It is music that grew up together with the liturgy, fraternal twins from the cradle, as intimately united as body and soul. This, in fact, is why the Second Vatican Council in the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacro Sanctum Concilium, elevated chant above all other forms of music and urged the careful adherence to tradition on this very point. Now I'm going to quote to you some, some precious lines from Vatican II. I don't often get to do that, so let me just uh, quote these. My favorite lines from Vatican II. Quote, the musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value, greater even than that of any other art. Now just pause there for a moment. That's an astonishing statement, right? Greater than Chartres Cathedral or Notre Dame in Paris, greater than all the statues and icons, greater than, than the chalices and the ciboria and the, and the monstrances in gold and silver, greater than any of these other works of art is the sacred music tradition of the church. That's an astonishing statement the council makes. But then it says, why? The main reason for this preeminence is that as sacred chant united to the words, the liturgy, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. In other words, you could have mass in an open field or in a bunker or, or, or in a, um, in a recusance attic in England, um, and you could do it with all kinds of poverty, but if you're going to sing the liturgy, you have to sing it in chant, so that the chant is an integral part of the liturgy more than all of the other arts are. Accordingly, the council continues, the sacred council keeping to the norms and precepts of ecclesiastical tradition and discipline, and having regard to the purpose of sacred music, which is the glory of God and the sanctification of the faithful, decrees as follows. Liturgical worship is given a more noble form when the divine offices are celebrated solemnly in chant. The treasure of sacred music is to be preserved and fostered with great care. Choirs must be diligently promoted. The church acknowledges Gregorian chant as specially suited or characteristically belonging to the Roman liturgy, with the result that, other things being equal, in liturgical services, it should hold the foremost place. So that's Vatican II for you. It is probably accurate to say that no other passage from the Council has been more systematically ignored and ruthlessly contradicted than this one. Chant is the musical home of the words of divine worship, the servant of its actions. Its exclusive function is to clothe in music God's holy words to us and our words to him and about him. It has no other realm or purpose. When we hear chant, 
There is no ambiguity or ambivalence about what it is or what it is for. It breathes the spirit of the liturgy and cannot be mistaken for secular music in any way. It's eight characteristics. I, I argue it has eight special characteristics. Primacy of the word, free rhythm, non-metrical rhythm, use of modes instead of keys, unison singing, unaccompanied vocalization, anonymity, emotional moderation, and unambiguous sacrality. Show that Gregorian chant is not just a little bit different from other types of music, but profoundly different, both beautiful and strange, as God himself is. Something similar is true about polyphonic singing and the use of the pipe organ, which, after many centuries of nearly exclusive use in churches, are so completely bound up with the ecclesiastical sphere that their sound equates with church or religion in the ears of most people. The long line of popes who have taught on sacred music maintain that these strong and deep associations are good and important. The fact that, that we have these instinctive or intuitive associations is something we should play upon and we should build upon it. Right? It follows that music with a double identity, music that involves teleological and tropological ambiguity, is problematic. Many contemporary church songs, especially in the so-called praise and worship genre, are nothing other than religiously themed pop songs. As one can see by examining the chord sequences, the shape of the melodies, the particular use of syncopation, the style of the singing with which it is marketed, and the ease with which percussion could be added or has been added. We can develop this critique if we look at the three criteria enunciated by Pope Pius X and expounded by Pope Pius XII. Holiness or sanctity, which I touched on a bit, goodness of form or artistic soundness, and universality, which one might also call Catholicity. As for the first quality, holiness or sanctity, sacred music is not to have any reminiscences of purely secular music, either in itself or in the manner in which it is performed. Consider this thought experiment. Play a random sampling of contemporary American church music for someone who does not speak English. You'd obviously have to find somebody like that. And ask, in his own language, of course, what he thinks the songs are all about. He might reasonably assume that they were secular love songs. A different way of running the same experiment. Take the same piece of church music, substitute, that is the contemporary church music, substitute lyrics about falling in love or world peace, and see if the words are incongruous with the musical style. They wouldn't be. In contrast, think of the absurdity of singing such worldly lyrics to the music of a Gregorian chant, Palestrina's Sicu Cervus, a chorale by J.S. Bach, or Durafle's Ubi Caritas, right? any piece of real sacred music. Moreover, the instrumentation and technique used for praise and worship with strummed guitars and or piano and even percussion strongly conveys the atmosphere of secular music, since these instruments originated in and are still associated with a variety of styles that have in common their extra-ecclesiastical nature. The romantic concert hall repertoire, jazz, early rock, country, and pop-influenced folk. That's where these, these instruments came from. They didn't come from the church. They came from outside the church. The style of popular Christian singing is one of its biggest problems. The voice slides from pitch to pitch with the scooping and warbling that derive from jazz and pop styles. In its origins, this manner of singing was intended to be a more passionate, realistic style, as opposed to the highly trained and therefore artificial voices of operatic singers. But it is no less opposed to the pure tone and lucid harmony aimed at in polyphonic ensembles and the tranquil unanimity aimed at in unison chanting both of which symbolize the unity and Catholicity of the church. As to the second quality, artistic goodness, sacred music should be resplendent for its formal integrity, radiating grandeur, majesty, dignity, loftiness, and transcendence, as the liturgy should do in all respects. Songs in the praise and worship genre are lacking or weak in those attributes just mentioned being characterized instead by simple, not to say simplistic, melodies and harmonies, and expressing a narrow emotional range. Such songs do not express or evoke their divine object, 
or the human person's spiritual nature with appropriate musical means. The regular metrical beat and the predictable sentimental melodies suggest a confinement to earthliness and the comfort of familiarity, as opposed to the free-floating word-based rhythms and the soaring, at times capricious modal melodies of traditional chanting and polyphony, which so well evoke the eternity, infinity, and strangeness of the divine. If someone were to object that the Holy Eucharist is a humble sacrament given under the signs of simple bread and wine, and that humble music, decor, and ceremonial is more appropriate than something elaborate and rich. I'm sure you've heard something of that sort here or there. The response would be that this is never the way the church has acted whenever she has been free to express her innermost nature. Her liturgy in the first centuries had of necessity to be relatively simple, since Christians were a bitterly persecuted minority who had to meet in secret without shrines or temples of their own. After the legalization of Christianity by Emperor Constantine, the liturgy moved out of the homes and catacombs into great basilicas, and all of its latent doxological energies were released. The basis of the Christian cult, the word made flesh, the splendor of the Eternal Father erupting into our world of sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, furnished the best, indeed irresistible and illimitable reason for incarnational worship, for outward and upward expansion in regard to its publicity, formality, solemnity, and glory. Thus, the Council of Trent declares, quote, since we must confess that no other work can be performed by the faithful that is so holy and divine as this awe-inspiring mystery, wherein that life-giving victim by which we are reconciled to the Father is daily immolated on the altar by priests. It is also sufficiently clear that all effort and attention must be directed to the end that it be performed with the greatest possible interior cleanness and purity of heart and exterior evidence of devotion and piety." Unquote. Pope John Paul II makes explicit what Trent implies. This is in John Paul II's final encyclical, Ecclesia de Eucharistia. Quote, like the woman who anointed Jesus in Bethany, the church has feared no extravagance, devoting the best of her resources to expressing her wonder and adoration before the unsurpassable gift of the Eucharist. With this heightened sense of mystery, we understand how the faith of the church in the mystery of the Eucharist has found historical expression not only in the demand for interior disposition of devotion, but also in outward forms meant to evoke and emphasize the grandeur of the event being celebrated." Unquote. According to St. Pius X, music that has the first two qualities, holiness and artistic soundness, will perforce have a third quality, universality. It will in some way be accessible to all believers and recognizable as appropriate for the liturgy. This is the trickiest quality of the three because some cultures are so primitive or uneducated that initially they may not have ears to appreciate the sanctity and beauty of a certain type of music that other Catholics already take for granted as sacred. On the other hand, Benedict XVI posits that the great music of the Western tradition has a universal power to move souls. He is therefore also of the opinion that the greatest sacred music has an inherent power to speak to God-thirsting souls and to convert them to Christ. Certainly, we can see in the historical records that Gregorian chant and polyphony were welcomed and taken up by peoples to whom the European missionaries preached, leading to amazing examples of enculturated but recognizably Catholic music a blend of the European aesthetic with native colors and accents. There's a wonderful group called the San Antonio Vocal Arts Ensemble, SAVE, that has done all kinds of recordings of music from Central and South America that was produced by native composers trained by the European missionaries. Amazing, amazing music, right? Very Catholic, very, you know, influenced by chant and polyphony, but also definitely sounding different, sounding more enculturated, more, um, for example, they use percussion instruments as part of this poly polyphonic music. So I, I encourage you to explore this repertoire a little bit. There's quite a bit of this real enculturated sacred, sacred music. A test for whether or not a style of music proposed for worship is truly universal is to ask whether imposing it on a foreign country or people would be a kind of imperialism. 
With Gregorian chant, the answer is in the negative, because like Latin, chant belongs to no single nation, people, period, or movement. You can't say Latin is the language of the Germans or the French or the Americans or whoever, and you can't say that about chant either. It belongs to everybody. It developed slowly from ancient times to more recent centuries across the entire map where Christianity was planted. Its composers are predominantly anonymous. It is the native musical clothing of the Latin Rite family of liturgies, something that, by the way, cannot be said of polyphony, as praiseworthy as it is. In short, wherever the Latin liturgy traveled throughout the world, even to China and Japan and India, there too Gregorian chant traveled and it has never been perceived as anything other than the voice of the church at prayer. In contrast, the style of praise and worship songs is obviously contemporary, American, and secular. If missionaries were to impose these songs on some indigenous tribe elsewhere in the world, it would be comparable to asking them to dress, eat, and talk like Americans. It is, in that sense, comparable to blue jeans, Coca-Cola, and iPhones. But what about emotions? A student once objected to me that St. Augustine considers affection of the heart, that's, his, that's Augustine's phrase, affection of the heart, so essential a component of prayer that if one's heart is not stirred, one is not truly praying, even if one has the right thoughts and the right intentions. Out of this patristic axiom, my interlocutor extrapolated the conclusion that emotionally rousing music, such as one finds in praise and worship, is helpful for animating prayer, perhaps even necessary for some people or in some circumstances. Not so fast. We cannot assume that our conception of emotional engagement is what Augustine meant by affection of the heart. Given that he famously objected to what he considered to be the sensuality of Ambrosian liturgical chant, which would doubtless not seem especially emotional by today's standards, it is, in fact, far more likely that Augustine would have strongly disapproved of contemporary Christian music. In the Confessions, we see him struggling with the question whether or not music should have any role in liturgy because of the danger that it may draw too much attention to itself or to its performers. He finally concludes that it can and should have a role, but only if it is restrained. A beautiful singing of a psalm might lead to tears, but these are the tears of the spiritually sensitive. Augustine's affection of the heart is a gentle movement of the heart towards the divine and away from reliance on the senses and the appetites of the flesh. The words of a modern Byzantine commentator about icons apply just as well to music for church, which ought to have an iconic function. You could think of music as being a, a, a sonic icon. He writes, Icons lift our soul from the material to the spiritual realm, from a lower level of being, thought, and feeling to a higher level. That's the direction that Christian art is supposed to have. We have to be extremely careful how we understand the role of emotions in worship. Unless we are sleeping or totally distracted, our emotions will inevitably be engaged in some way, at some level. If you have a pulse, you have emotions. It is not really a question of emotionlessness versus emotionalism, but a question of whether the emotional state we are in is, number one, a state of self-contained boredom, number two, an excitation and agitation of feelings, or number three, the quiet intensity of looking and listening for the truth above and beyond oneself. The first and the second differ in the degree of activity, but they do not differ in regard to whether there has been a genuine transcendence of oneself in one's worldly frame of reference. A culture predisposed to think everyone should be on a high as often as possible via athletics, drugs, sex, or rock concerts will likewise incline people to think that prayer and the worship of God ought to be the same way, ought to be characterized by being on a high. Sacred music, however, has never aimed at such an emotional high. In fact, it has conscientiously avoided it to guard against the danger of fallen man becoming submerged in and thus limited by his feelings, which are a very unstable platform. As Dom Gregory Hugel observes, divine providence has arranged that liturgical music should be austere and unyielding to personal whims. The sentiments of profound reverence mingled with fear and love 
break the snares which Satan has laid for the church singer. That's, that's, that was something written around the year 1920. People don't write that way anymore. Sacred music gently moves man's emotions in order to foster the intellectual activities of meditation and contemplation. The music should be the servant of meditation and contemplation. This approach corresponds to the timeless advice of the spiritual masters, who, while recognizing that emotion has a legitimate value, are cautious about deliberately stoking it or tapping into it for religious purposes. Emotion is more likely to have a clouding or distracting effect than a clarifying or concentrating one. Instead of facilitating the ascent of the mind to God, it can lead to an illusion of self-transcendence that is evanescent and disappointing. The much-loved spiritual author, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, maybe you've heard of his book, it's called The Practice of the Presence of God. He writes, outside of feelings of surprise, a person should not allow himself to be carried away with his feelings because God should remain the master and center of our attention. Brother Lawrence goes on to warn, those who conduct themselves in the spiritual life only by following their particular dispositions and feelings, who believe that they have nothing more important to do than to examine whether they are full of devotion or not, he means feelings of devotion, this sort of person could not possibly be stable or certain in his conduct, because these things change continually, whether by our own negligence or by the order of God, who varies his gifts and his conduct towards us according to our needs. An expert on Carmelite mysticism, Father Thomas Dubé, writes in his magnum opus, it's called The Fire Within. He says, holiness does not consist in delights at prayer. When God does not give the feelings of devotion even to generous people, they should not be in the least upset, but should rather merely conclude that this emotional dimension is not presently necessary. To summarize our critique, praise and worship music is not suitable for liturgical use. Its style reinforces a false con conception of the church's liturgy as communal gatherings in which subjective feelings, informality, and spontaneity play a large role. In reality, as Romano Guardini and Joseph Ratzinger show, divine liturgy is characterized by objectivity, formality, and unspontaneity. And only because it has these qualities can it have the power to be, for all of us, the fixed principle of our thoughts and actions, the rock on which we can build our interior life, the infinitely pleasing worship that is offered not so much by us as by our high priest and by us in union with him. The Mass, in particular, must not be so weighed down with sentimentality and subjectivity that its essence is clouded by its accidents, and we lose sight of what it actually is, the mystical representation of Christ's supreme sacrifice on the cross. We know this truth only by faith-informed intellects and never by a psychosomatic faculty, whether it be the external senses, the imagination, or the emotions. We participate in this objective public solemn offering primarily by uniting our mind and will to the prayers of the priest and to the realities they point to. At the same time, the externals of the liturgy should lead our minds and hearts in the direction of the faith-perceived mystery, so that what we sense and what we believe do not seem to be at odds, but rather converge in harmony, what we sense and what we believe. The sensible elements of the liturgy are meant to evoke and gesture towards the imperceptible mystery, inviting us to make acts of adoration, contrition, supplication, and thanksgiving in the presence of our Lord's redeeming sacrifice, and to participate in it most intimately by receiving Holy Communion. All of this that I just described is something that totally transcends the emotional realm as such. And while it is true that the Lord sometimes grants strong emotions to individuals as an encouragement or prompting or consolation, we relate to the essence of what is taking place in the Mass through our intellect and will, properly cleared, focused, and directed. Moreover, there cannot be a place for contemporary pop-inspired or pop-influenced music in the liturgy because it violates several of the principles repeatedly given in authoritative church documents. The fact that many priests and bishops do not enforce these rules and do not seem to care is beside the point, just as the fact that most Catholics dissent from humane vitae, including many members of the clergy, does not justify contraception. 
Many Catholics are in a state of colossal ignorance, habitual carelessness, and sometimes outright disobedience. And we must plainly admit that the current crisis of identity, doctrine, and discipline in the Church is an unsurprising result. I would go further and say we need to be moving away from the fashion or fad of using music derived from contemporary popular styles at any liturgical or devotional activity. We would do well in Eucharistic adoration, for example, to allow silence to predominate, and at judicious moments to make use of simpler chants, like the Adore Te Devote, or the Ave Verum Corpus, or the Tantum Ergo. Silent prayer combined with chant allows people of very different temperaments, personalities, ages, and situations they may be going through to be united in prayer in a way that can be adapted to the needs of each. A more stirring form of music, while it may have a place in Christian recreational sittings around that campfire, does not facilitate group prayer, a fortiori liturgical prayer, in the way that silence, chant, and polyphony do. Some people object that the church's traditional music is too hard, too difficult for people nowadays. They need easier stuff to sing. I admit this is kind of the final objection that people make when they give up their other objections and they finally just come down to saying, well, it's impossible, you can't do it. When my son, who was no prodigy, was five years old, he could sing the four major Marian antiphons, Salve Regina, Ave, Ave, uh, um, Ave Regina Celorum, uh, Regina Celi, and Alma Redemptoris Mater. Uh, when he was five, he was singing that. By the time he was six, he could sing the Missa Orbis Factor, the Missa De Angelis, and other chants familiar in our church without being able to read the music. He had no idea how to read the music. My daughter was the same way. Other, but you could say, well, that's because you're a musician. Well, no, other boys and girls in the community were no different. Since children are gifted learners by ear, they're sponges. And many chants have captivating melodies. Children quickly pick up these chants if they live in families and communities that prize them. It's as simple as that. This is how tradition was and is always passed down, naturally, painlessly, orally, through a common treasuring of traditional things and a common use of them. In the heyday of the burgeoning Gregorian chant revival before Vatican II, Justine Ward had developed an incremental method, it's called the Ward Method, by which schools across the world were successfully teaching chant to thousands of children. There were public liturgies at which crowds of boys and girls would beautifully chant the ordinary of the Mass. At the principal, I'll give you an example. At the principal Mass of the Eucharistic Congress in Chicago in 1926, a choir of 62,000 children, 62,000 children drawn from hundreds of parochial schools came together to chant the Mass in unison. Such endeavors could easily have kept growing and continued well into our day, propelled by Vatican II's encomium of chant. But the 1960s and 1970s were not a propitious time for the preservation of tradition. Those in charge of institutions gambled on the supposed evangelistic benefits of modernization and let go of precious cultural treasures even when sociologists of religion were predicting a renewal of interest in tradition among those searching for meaning in an increasingly chaotic post-Christian West, and were expressing doubts about the staying power of shallow contemporary substitutes for perennial things. If we look east to the Byzantine sphere, we can still find congregations accustomed to singing liturgical texts in three or four harmonized parts. This is common throughout the Eastern Christian world. Western Christians easily pick it up, as I experienced firsthand in Byzantine liturgies at the International Theological Institute in Gaming, Austria, when it was in Gaming, and at Wyoming Catholic College, where there's a Byzantine chaplaincy. Truly, the capacity of the human soul for great music is limitless. We should not underestimate either the capacity or the need for excellence in this domain. No one should ever assume that young people today cannot become cultured or acquire a wide intellectual purview, as if being primitive or illiterate is an unavoidable condition of modern youth. That's an insult to modern youth. It is a social and cultural choice we have made in creating and perpetuating the artificial post-World War II category of the teenager. In reality, as Romano Gordini asserts, 
quote, a fairly high degree of genuine learning and culture is necessary in the long run in order to keep spiritual life healthy. By means of these two things, that is learning and culture, spiritual life retains its energy, clearness, and catholicity. Culture preserves, culture preserves spiritual life from the unhealthy, eccentric, and one-sided elements with which it tends to get involved only too easily. The church desires as a rule that spiritual life should be impregnated with the wholesome salt of genuine and lofty culture." Unquote. Romano Gordini. The church has an obligation to immerse her children in her own heritage from birth onwards. As the psychiatrist Jean Piaget demonstrated, the early years of a child are the cultural womb that completes the process of gestation. All Catholic children, all Catholic children, should be singing the Salve Regina and the Gloria by the age of five or six. A failure to give this heritage of beauty and spiritual strength to the little ones so loved by our Lord is a kind of high treason against the supernatural polity of the people of God. We must not underestimate the capacity of young people and of the laity in general to enjoy, appreciate, participate in, and grow spiritually from the traditions of the Catholic Church. A true spiritual hunger exists in the world. It is not only growing, but also unfortunately assuming deviant forms because it does not find satisfaction in much of what is being offered in the name of relevance and enculturation. I will bring my talk now to a conclusion. In the 60s and 70s, it was often said that the church had to reconfigure herself from top to bottom because modern man needs something different from his forebears. And today, alas, the same message is repeated ad nauseam. But modern man is not essentially different from the man of any age. His spiritual needs are fundamentally the same as they have always been. What people today need is not something new, changing, ephemeral, fashionable, but something timeless and perennial, connecting them across the ages with their forefathers and uniting them to the Lord in adoration. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye on the ways and seek and ask for the old paths, which is the good way, and walk ye in it, and you shall find refreshment for your souls. Jeremiah 6, 16. The life of prayer and worship that sustained centuries of faith the glorious armies of confessors, virgins, martyrs, holy laity, will sustain us, too, better than any modern innovations. On a certain occasion, when Pope Benedict XVI was speaking about the great Byzantine poet and composer Romanus the Melodist, he explained that the work of such artists, quote, reminds us of the entire treasure of Christian culture born of faith, born of the heart that has found Christ, the Son of God. From this contact of the heart with the truth that is love, culture is born, the entire great Christian culture. And if the faith continues to live, this cultural inheritance will not die, but rather it will continue to live and be current. Icons continue to speak to the hearts of believers to this day. They are not things of the past. The cathedrals are not medieval monuments. Rather, they are houses of life where we feel at home, where we find God and each other. Neither is great music, Gregorian chant, Bach, or Mozart, something of the past. Rather, it lives in the vitality of the liturgy and our faith. If faith is alive, Christian culture will never be outdated, but rather will, rem will remain alive and current." Unquote. It's Benedict XVI. Thanks to the profound teaching and compelling example of Pope Benedict XVI, which also remain alive and current in spite of successive assaults against them, we have entered a new era of rediscovering a lost heritage and rejoicing in its wondrous beauty. The Church of the future will have a growing number of people who ask for and deserve to receive all that the Church herself and she alone can offer to them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Scola of Franciscan University of Steubenville for performing those two pieces.
Um, part of the concept behind combining the lecture and the performance, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like the ancient um, uh, combination of theory and praxis, you know, of uh, the speculative and the practical domains. That is to say, um, a lot of church music is still being written. Those were my compositions. Uh, I know many other composers, many, many composers, who are writing uh, what I think is, is, is quite suitable music for the sacred liturgy, um, you know, using both traditional texts and sometimes new texts. Uh, and I, I think that, um, that th we, we shouldn't have this concept that sacred music is something simply from past centuries that modern people are incapable of writing or contributing to. Um, we can contribute to it, and we can do so in a way that, although it respects the tradition and it learns from the tradition and even emulates aspects of the tradition, as, as my pieces in, had certain Renaissance traits to them, but they also sound modern. There are harmonies in those two pieces you just listened to that you would never find except in the last hundred years, right? Um, so it's, it's, but it's a tradition, right? And a tradition by its nature grows slowly. It doesn't have wild disconnects and massive ruptures in it. The transition from, from early medieval music to late medieval music to the Renaissance to the Baroque to the classical period, it can look like dramatic shifts when you only sample it at 100-year intervals. But when you listen to composers all the way along, it's more of a continuum, right? Um, and what's fascinating to me is that, to a greater or lesser extent, all of the styles remain in play. That is, the later periods don't just get rid of the earlier periods, but they incorporate them in some fashion or they, or they pay homage to them. Um, Mozart, for instance, towards the end of his career, began to incorporate more traits from Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, into his music. Uh, and in the Catholic Church, most of all, because the Catholic Church was and should be a conservative institution, all of the phases of music remained alive in the Catholic Church. That is to say, even when mo masses by Mozart were being performed, at the cathedral in Salzburg, Gregorian chant from a thousand years earlier was still being sung as well, right? The, the church is conservative. She carries with her the heritage of all of the ages. So we can, we can I'll just say this last thing because I've, I've got questions here, I'm supposed to say. But uh, we can tell that there's a problem in the past roughly 60 years, though it, it goes back in, it goes back throughout the whole 20th century, really. I think it's, it's fundamental, but it's more after World War II. And, and, and then especially after Vatican II, when you have this extremely sharp rupture where nothing prior to that point is used anymore, right? Then you know that there is a deviation. In fact, a very serious deviation. Something unprecedented has occurred there, right? And it's not Catholic. So this is one of the points that I really want to, to bring out. Um, okay, let's take some of these questions. I, I don't know if I'll be able to get to all of them, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. How does music impact the formation of children? Um, well, I touched on that a little bit. Children are like sponges. They absorb their, their surrounding influences very easily. Um, if you take a child, and, and again, I saw this firsthand, if you take a child to a high mass, a chanted high mass with incense and so forth, it's not long before those children are going to start going around at home with like some kind of kitchen implement, trying, you know, incensing things, and they're singing chant, which is nonsense because they don't know the word. But it's, they're internalizing it, and they're imitating it, and they're playing. But by play, they're sort of internalizing and thinking through what these, what these, these events are, um, even almost at a pre-conscious or pre-rational level. Uh, so I think that the environment of, uh, that children are in is, is, is crucial. That means they should, be watch, they should be mostly read to and reading rather than looking at screens all the time. They should be listening to or surrounded with good music, classical music, um, with, with maybe some examples of sacred music uh, you know, it, at the, in the home. Um, families should be singing folk songs and, and chants to the extent that they can. I know not everybody's equally musical, but everybody can learn how to sing. Um, most everybody. I, there are some rare exceptions. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, uh, and so I, I, do, I do think we, you know, um, I think children should have, to the extent possible, I think they should have toys made out of wood rather than plastic. I mean, like, I don't know how far into the details you want to get, but I think that natural materials and good cultural influences are absolutely crucial for the, I mean, for all of our lives, but especially the first six years, there's, that's an irreplaceable foundation for the formation of the imagination and the memory. Um, and child psychology confirms all of this. I mentioned Piaget. Maria Montessori is another great uh, source for this. Although you have to be a little careful with her because she was a Catholic uh, and she had very 
to our ears, traditional sounding ideas. And the people who took over her works later on often sanitized her works to try to make them less Catholic. So when you're studying Montessori, if any of you want to do that, make sure you get the original editions. Try to get the oldest editions possible. Um, so those are just some thoughts about the nation of children. Um, what do you think is the future of sacred music in the liturgy? Is its use advancing or receding in general around the world? Uh, this is a very difficult question to ask because the map, the sort of liturgical and musical map of the Catholic Church right now, it, it looks like a National Geographical survey map of the Western United States with all kinds of, like a patchwork of, you know, federal land, uh, state-owned land, BLM land, private land, whatever. You know, it's, it's just, it's a patchwork. So, it, I mean, the variations you can get from one diocese to the next, one parish to the next, even one priest to the next, or one, or one mass to the next, are, can be huge, huge variations. So it's, it's kind of, but I would say this much. Um, there is a growing appetite for an interest in traditional sacred music. That is definitely the case. There are, there are many Gregorian chant scholas that are being founded every year. I know this, I kind of keep track of this stuff. Um, and there are many scholas being founded. Um, there are many younger priests who want to incorporate this kind of music back into the mass after decades of, of its absence. Um, there are conferences, lots of conferences that people can go to, put on by the Church Music Association of America and its equivalent in other countries. Um, the recordings of sacred music are selling through the roof. They're, they're often on the, on the um, billboard, you know, top 10 lists, right? So the, there's a hunger for this, this music and this heritage, um, and just in general, I'd say, among modern people, a hunger, hunger, hunger for the sacred, um, for the manifestly and palpably um, sacral. Uh, and I think, so I do think there is a revival going on. Um, it's just such a, such a patchwork, right? And it depends so much on personalities and places. Um, and that's the unfortunate part. I think it would be really nice if someday we had, someday we had a pope who didn't just say, this is the ideal, but this is what's required, and here's how it's required, and here's how the requirement will be established. Um, but it's, it's actually hard to imagine at this moment a pope being able to do that successfully, right? Um, so it, it's a complicated situation. Um, you know, Pope Benedict XVI, who's kind of a tragic figure in some ways, he, uh, he once said to uh, a close associate, um, this close associate said to him, why don't you fix X, Y, Z problem in the church? And Pope Benedict said, my, my authority ends at that door. We were pointing to the door of his office. Uh, it's very sad, you know, but he had this sense that if he put his foot down, a lot of people would just ignore or laugh uh, at him, right? Um, so anyway, it's, it's, um, I think that what's more likely to happen is a grassroots revival than a top-down imposition. Uh, and there are problems with top-down impositions in any case um, because they can create resentments and, and other problems. But the gra on the grassroots level, yes, I definitely see good things happening in terms of sacred music. Um, all right. Is praise and worship music okay in church outside of Mass? Um, is, is, it, is it okay for adoration? Could we say that the Psalms are precedents for this? Okay, so my opinion, which I broached in, in the talk, um, is, is I will admit that it's, a, it's probably the strongest version of the thesis that you can have. But my thesis is, my general thesis is that human beings after the fall, and this is not my thesis, this is Thomas Aquinas who says this, so I, I do the authority behind me here, but um, that our emotions are thrown, were thrown out of whack. The emotions of human nature, our feelings, our emotions, our passions are, are kind of a jangled mess most of the time. And what we need to do is calm them and put order into them. That's what we need most. I'm not saying there's never a time like, like a bullfighter needs to really get some emotions going, right? Or there's not going to be a, he's very successful at goring the bull. But, but in general, we, we actually need to calm our emotions, especially when it comes to, to acts of religious worship, where we're trying to, in a sense, rise above our nature by God's grace, not just by our own effort. We're trying to, to rise to a plateau that's actually rather difficult for us to achieve. We're rational animals and we're fallen creatures. Um, we're animals, that is, and we're fallen. 
Um, and so I think that in general, music should calm and still the emotions. And I also think that silence, I, mean, I agree, agree very much with Cardinal Seurat, that silence is way more important than people realize. And that an hour of silent adoration is going to do a lot more good than an hour of adoration which people are constantly singing, even if they're singing psalms, right? Um, but, you know, I think there's room for disagreement uh, on that point. I'm, I'm, what I'm really adamant about and what I would say there isn't room for disagreement about is, is what's appropriate for mass and, uh, and the, uh, for the mass in particular. For other informal prayer gatherings, I think you could argue in different, in different ways. Um, I do think that if people experienced the benefits of, let's say, chanting the Psalms in the traditional way that they were chanted for the divine office in the chant tones, um, yes, it takes some getting used to. It's not an instant, you know, instant, um, what's the word? Um, uh, like, you, you don't just sing Vespers once and suddenly realize, you know, oh, this is what I've always been looking for. Some people might have that reaction. But after, after time, the, the traditional way of chanting the Psalms actually really, really does grow on you, and it, it plants the Word of God very deeply, and it, it makes you kind of, it's like slow cooking. It makes things slow cook inside of you. Um, and I think, in general, that traditional liturgical prayer is a kind of sl slow food, a slow cooking model. That is, it's meant to take many years to understand it and to grasp it. And we, we need to give ourselves that time, that leisure. Um, modern people are very impatient, and they kind of want, like, what's the bottom line? Give, give it to me right now, you know? Uh, and that's not the way that I think anything great or subtle or, or, or difficult um, or spiritual works. <clears throat> Do you have any book recommendations regarding the liturgy and or music? Well, as a matter of fact, I've got some books back there on the table. <laughs> so, so I'll just mention that. But I, I, did, I did just, my most recent book is called Good Music, Sacred Music, and Silence. And it talks at, at much greater length about the things that I talked about in, today. So if you're interested in those topics, you can check that out. Uh, but those books also have, all of my books always have bibliographies with recommended readings. And... Um, uh, and, they, and, I, and often I even indicate, like I make notes about the readings or I, I get put stars next to the ones that I think are the best. You know, just I try to guide people because it's kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of material out there. Um, so anyhow. I will, okay, I will mention one book. Um, it's an incredibly good book. It's by a, a, a German priest and, and a patristics scholar named Mikhail Fiedrowitz, F-I-E-D-R-O-W-I-C-Z. Okay, easy to spell. Um, so Michael Fiedrowitz, it's called the traditional. It's called the. It's called the traditional mass: the history, form, and theology of the classical Roman rite. That's the title of the book. This is a marvelous introduction to the subject. It, 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 it talks about the history of the mass from the early centuries, what we know, which is not a whole lot, up until the present. And then it talks about all the different aspects of the Mass and why they're there and why they are the way they are. And then it talks about the theological implications of all of these things, like ad orientem. It has a great section on Gregorian chant, has a section on um, uh, you know, why Latin and all these sorts of things. So if you, if you want to do like a deeper dive into the understanding of the traditional Roman liturgy, that would be the number one book I always recommend it to people. Um, okay, are there rubrics against using pianos or guitars at mass? In fact, there are. Um, so there's a specific rubric, there's a specific... Let me back up. Pope St. Pius X issued a document in 1903 called Tra le Solicitudini, which, was, uh, which he described as a legal code for sacred music. So the, the, the language he used was, this is basically like canon law. This is a legal code. And in that document, he specifically says pianos are not allowed in church. And he also says there that women are not allowed to sing the parts of the Mass. But Pius XII later on changed that and said women are allowed to sing the parts of the Mass. Now, the, but he never, no one ever changed the piano part. <laughs> so technically speaking, that is still on the books, right? Um, it's still part of the legal code of the church. Now, of course, everybody ignores it, but that's kind of par for the course. We're, we're living in, an, Cardinal Burke says we're living in an era of antinomianism. That's not, if that's not a word you know, you should definitely memorize that one. Antinomianism, nomos is law in Greek, so antinomian means an anti-law attitude. 
Um, and so like 1968 and all in the Cultural Revolution, that was the epitome of antinomianism, right? And that spirit prevails. Um, so you, you, you have people ignoring something like trilay solicitudinis, legal code. But the thing I want to, the point I want to make about the, the women singing in church is that Pius X was originally talking about a scola of, of men singing in the sanctuary or in the transept of a church in what used to be called the choir area of a church. It's a little confusing because we don't really use that term very often, but sometimes in bigger cathedrals you see extra seating in the sanctuary, and that's where the canons of the cathedral would sit and chant the office. Well, if you're going to have vested singers in the sanctuary, then they need to be men. That's what Pius X's point was, and that actually is, I would still defend that principle. Um, but Pius XII, I mean, by the t even by the time Pius X was writing, and certainly by the time Pius XII was writing, most Catholic choirs were singing from a choir loft in the back of the church, like that loft up there you know, is where the singers were. They were completely, they were pretty much as far away from the sanctuary as you could be. And in that situation, it seemed arbitrary to say that you couldn't have a mixed choir, right? So that's why Pius XII relaxed that particular point. I wrote an article about this if you're interested in looking it up online. All right. Um, oh, about guitars. There's no specific statement about guitars in any magisterial document, but there are many statements about not bringing into the church instruments that originate from and are associated with secular forms of music. And when guitars were first brought into the Catholic Church, they were definitely brought over from the Bob Dylan, Joan Baez world. I mean, they, they, they explicitly were brought over from the Woodstock uh, um, stage into the Catholic churches. That was part of the plan, is that this is the popular music of the day, let's get it into the churches, and then more people will be presumably, arguably, or supposedly, more people will be interested in going to Mass because now they can hear at Mass the same music that they go to concerts to hear. And, of course, this is a completely self-defeating argument because the church can never compete and should not even try to compete with secular musicians. The church is not in the business of making music for money or for entertainment. That's not the business of the church. The church's business is to pray, to pray the liturgy in music. And she already knows how to do that, right, in the most fitting way. Um, all right. <laughs> wow, some of these questions. We could be here all day, so I'll try. We could, um, <clears throat> what qualities make music good and beautiful, and what would need to be in sacred music as well as secular music for it to be considered good? I think I've probably answered that already, but in general, I, I, I always put it in terms of an analysis of, of the rhythm, the harmony, the rhythm, the melody, the harmony, the lyrics. Those are the most important aspects of music. Uh, and they need to be, the lyrics need to be evaluated in terms of their moral value and their poetic value. That's the way you evaluate lyrics. You evaluate the other components in terms of do they observe the right hierarchy of rhythm, melody, and harmony? And is there a, a I, I'll use the word sophisticated, but that, that's a, maybe not the best word. Is there an artful? or elegant or graceful use of those things in conjunction with each other. Because art should be good. Art should be good. There's not really a place, there's not enough time in human life, in my opinion, for crummy art, right? What are we wasting our time for on crummy art? So if we can have good melodies, beautiful melodies, Tchaikovsky-type melodies, right, or Gregorian melodies, if we can have the kind of rhythms that you find in the great composers and their integration with the melody and the harmony, you know, if you can find those sorts of things, why wouldn't you go for them, right? So I think um, that's what I would say about that. How do you think Latin should be taught? Do you support the direct method? Uh, well, this is an easy question to answer. Direct method is also called the nature method or the conversational method. Um, that is teaching Latin orally. I do think that's the best way to teach Latin. I think that it's good for people to understand that Latin is a, is a language, like any other language, although it has special characteristics like any language, um, and that uh, it's not some kind of archaic, esoteric code, like computer programming or something, right? You know, you don't speak computer programming, you just type it out. Uh, well, sim well, well, a language is something that's meant to be spoken and heard, and you're supposed to be able to crack a joke in that language, you know, and laugh about it, and, and uh, you know, see it effectively communicating. Um, so I think that's, that's very important. It also, though, is the case that 
Latin instruction, it, it's, it's challenging because um, you can get to a certain basic proficiency in everyday Latin, uh, you know, and have a conversation about drinking coffee and sleeping and, you know, doing your homework and your dog and whatever. You can talk about these things, but there also has to be a point at which you really kind of roll up your sleeves and do the heavy lifting in terms of written Latin and especially like poetry in Latin. If you want to, if you want to ever read like the hymns of the breviary and make any sense out of them at all, then it's, you're going to have to do something that goes much beyond the, what the oral method will typically be able to reach, right? Um, I think you'd have to be, uh, now I do know some families, uh, and I kind of envy, I envy these children, but I know some families where the parents are speaking Latin all the time to each other, so the kids grow up speaking it, that's like, oh man. Uh, but anyway, I feel, I feel a bit envious of those kids, but uh, good. And of course, you probably know this, but before the Second Vatican Council, um, Every, all those clergy learned how to speak Latin. They took their courses in Latin. I mean, this varied from place to place, country to country, but predominantly, there was, there was some level of fluency or competency in Latin throughout the Catholic Church in most countries, maybe nearly all countries, up until the 1960s. That's amazing. What did we, how, why, yeah, why did we lose that? Well, I'm sorry if this is gonna sound like a conspiracy theory, but I think you can back it up with historical research. Uh, I think that Latin was given up deliberately to cause the rupture, right? That is to say, to rupture people from their past, from, from let's say, 1,800 years of Latin Christendom, Latin language Christendom, right? Most of which has never been translated into the vernacular. So most of our heritage as Roman Catholics, quantitatively speaking, is just in Latin. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're a liberal or a progressive or a modernist in the church, the most effective way of undermining Catholicism is to cut people off from that Latin heritage. So there was a deliberate effort made to cut people off from Latin. Um, and that is, that's a grievous wound that needs to be healed, right? definitely. Well, um, so here's a question. What is the difference between religious music and sacred music? Um, I think that's a good, there is a reasonable distinction you can make. So, a lot of to, sacred music tends to be used by the magisterium of the church as equivalent to liturgical music. That is music that is actually sets to music the words of the liturgy itself or is directly connected with that, um, you know, in some sense, uh, intimately connected with the liturgy. Religious music is a broader category because there are, for example, popular religious songs. Every, every country has these. You know, in the 19th century in, in Italy or Germany, when you went on a Corpus Christi procession, People sang some Latin chants, but they also sang a lot of German or Italian popular religious songs. To Our Lady, to Our Lord, to the saints, the patron saint, whoever. Um, and a lot of that poetry can be kind of sentimental in nature, but it's decent and it has a function. The function is to, have, to give people a chance to sort of belt out these sort of beautiful, nice melodies as you're going on a procession. Um, you know, and, and so I think there is a role for religious music, which is a broader category than sacred or liturgical music. Definitely. And we have a lot of hymns in English that, that would um, qualify for that. Um, hymns in the sense of like four or five verse English hymns of the sort that a lot of people, like, like um, you know, um, A Mighty Fortress is Our God by Martin Luther, as it happens. Uh, or, uh, you know, um, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. Or, you know, all these sorts of hymns that, that used to be sung and still are sung in, in some places, especially the Anglican Ordinariate. Those, are, those originated outside of the Mass, and to a large extent, even outside of the Catholic Church. And I would, I would really characterize those as religious singing, not as liturgical singing. And so if you, like in my, in my I, have, I go to a fraternity of St. Peter Parish, and we do sing English hymns, but we sing them I, either at the procession of the clergy before Mass begins, or at the, when the clergy recess afterwards. And so basically they're outside of the Mass, these, these English hymns. Um, when the Mass begins with the asperges or the introit, it's all Latin after that, until the final gospel, and then we can... So I, I, don't, I have no problem with that kind of thing. That's, that seems, it seems like a good thing to be familiar with, with vernacular hymns. Um, okay. Ooh, who is your favorite composer of sacred music? And by the way, if I don't get to one of your questions, just come and bother me. Or, or not, you're not a bother, but come and talk to me uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the table back there afterwards, because I, I really can't do all of them. But um, my favorite composer, very difficult to say, 
I tend to have favorite composers for each period. So um, for, for polyphony, um, I think that Palestrina's music is actually the, it really is the most perfect liturgical music because it, it, is, it, it just effortlessly integrates into the liturgy and it doesn't, it has no special effects that draw attention to itself as a, as a work of art, but it, it's very humble. It kind of effaces itself. It's beautiful, but it creates a beautiful atmosphere or aura and the music is kind of, it's very soft and subtle. And so it doesn't, um, whereas like some of the other Renaissance composers, uh, like I'll take an extreme example, like Gesualdo. Um, some of these composers, they kind of, they use extreme dissonances, which are very cool, musically cool, but, uh, but they're, they're, they kind of like, they make you turn your head and think about the choir rather than about the liturgy. So I think in a way they're, they're not as perfect as the liturgical music. Um, but the Spanish Renaissance composers are my favorite from a purely musical point of view, like Victoria, Morales, Guerrero, those, those composers are just exquisite, exquisite from a musical point of view, and also quite good for liturgy. Um, I think for the other periods, well, yeah, I mean, I won't give you, but for the modern period, for the 20th century, my favorite living composer of quasi-sacred music, maybe religious music would be better to say, is, is a composer named Arvo Pert from uh, Estonia. He's still alive, he was born in 1935, so he must be getting up there in, in years. What, what, is, what would that be, 80 something, uh, however old that is. But uh, he's still alive, he still composes a little bit, but, but his great period of composing was like the 70s until the early 2000s. Um, and if you haven't ever heard any of Arvo Pert's music, P-A-R-T, P the A has an umlaut over it, two dots, um, you, you might want to, uh, to go and listen to um, his Te Deum, his setting of the Te Deum. It's just a like, shatteringly grand piece of music. Um, okay, very good. I will, I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. I know it's kind of hot in here, but thank you so much. <laughs>